everybody. Um, today we are going to do um, a figure of language connotative and denotative uh, lesson, um, and it's going to be practicing our speaking. Um, our standard today is um, ELA, uh, GSE. Georgia's uh, Standard Vernacular, Grade 6, uh, RL4, which is Reading Literature 4, and it means to determine the meaning of words and phrases as they are used in a text, including figurative and connotative meaning. Analyze the impact of a specific word choice on meaning and tone. Our content objective today is students will identify words and phrases that qualify as similes, metaphors, and personification. So at the end of this lesson, you will be able to identify words and phrases that qualify as similes, metaphors, and personification. The language objective for today is that the, you're at the end of the lesson, you'll be able to identify words and phrases that convey description and feeling, and um, you'll be able to participate in shared oral reading and discussion of the lesson's reading content as it is in the ready lesson. Key vocabulary that we need to keep in mind today, connote, connotative, literal, and figurative language, vivid, simile, metaphor, and personification. So um, we'll start with the easy ones. Uh, simile is a comparison of two unlike things using words like like and as. A metaphor is a comparison of two unlike things in where one thing becomes the other thing. And personification is a comparison, but it is where you give human characteristics to an object or an item that is not human. Um, Connote is the verb that lets you know that it gives this meaning. Connotation is, connotative is where a dictionary definition is a denotation. You'd look up a word in the dictionary and it would tell you what it means. Connotative meaning is how that word makes you feel. So you have positive, negative, and neutral connota uh, connotations. Um, literal meaning means exactly what you say. Figurative meaning means that it's a figurative speech and it doesn't mean exactly what it says. Here's an example. Um, I'll use the hyperbole. It is rainy or an idiom. It is raining cats and dogs. Is it literally outside raining and cats and dogs are falling from the sky? That would be what it would literally mean. And figuratively, it means that it's raining very hard. So that's figurative and literal uh, language. And then vivid means that it's um, very uh, apparent. It's, it, is, it is not like a lazy verb. It's, it's a very active verb. It's a vivid verb. Do you have any questions on these words? Yeah. And also, excuse me, vivid can, um, uh, you want to understand that can be an adjective too because it's describing. So just like a vivid verb is not a bland verb, but a very uh, charged verb, vivid adjectives or description are going to be very colorful and not bland and boring. Okay, our activator for today. Do you think that you would trudge through the snow or stroll through the snow? So take a few minutes, think about that, write your, your choice on the sticky note. Does anybody need any help? 
okay? Let's discuss these two words and see if you were able to choose the one that most goes with our, our topic here of basically moving through the snow. Are we trudging, which is a verb, or strolling? Um, so uh, the two verbs, they're vivid verbs because there's actually a lot of action going on there. Um, they have similar meanings, which means to move, but each one has a different connotative meaning. So, um, and we can take the snow out of the picture for a moment and we can put it on you guys. When you come to school and in the first thing in the morning, you've got your backpack on your back, you've got your lunchbox in your arm, uh, you're either trudging or you're strolling down the hall. And the other side of that would be when we go to lunch and we're walking down the hall and all you have is your lunchbox or you have nothing at all if you didn't bring your lunchbox from home, then you would be doing the other one. So one of these is more of a positive way to say that you're moving about and one is has a more negative connotation. So which one do you think sounds like it would be harder to do? Trudge or stroll? Okay, how many of you put trudge on your sticky note prior to our explanations of the two verbs. Very good. Um, and the rest of you put stroll, which is not very many. And you, you both are right in that you are moving through the snow, but, and you know, being in the South, we do stroll through the snow because we don't have that much on the ground to trudge through. Now, if you're living in the north where I grew up, then you trudge through the snow because it sometimes comes up to your knees. So you're both correct in a way, but what we were going for here is to teach you connotation of two different words that writers use these kind of words to create interesting effects. Um, and this kind of language is called figurative language. And so, I, excuse me, so we say trudge is the struggle and stroll is the relaxing walk. Yes, and I see a typographical error, so you're going to have to give me a minute because I have to fix these right away. Now, for the introduction to the rest of this lesson, turn to page 129 in the Ready Book, and it's lesson 13, and you'll see that we've used the top part of this as our activator. Would you rather trudge or stroll through the snow? Um, and so now we're going to look at the cartoon. See the cartoon in the middle of your page? Look at the cartoon. The cartoon um, has a little girl with her helmet on, and her, she has her wrecked bicycle lying on the ground, and it looks as though to me she has hurt her knee in some way, because if you look at the little lines in front of her knee, that symbolizes some kind of movement or draws attention to her knee. Um, the words on the page say, tears fell from her face like rain from the sky. So why do you think the writer compared the girl's tears to rain? It's not likely that the water pouring from, it is not likely that water is pouring from the girl's eyes. But the writer wants you to know that she is crying 
part or she's crying a little bit. If it's compared to rain. So is she crying hard and a lot of tears or barely crying? If it's like rain from the sky. Okay, that's true. It depends on how hard it's raining. Um, but I think since we have a bicycle accident here, we can infer that she's crying a little bit harder than just a little weak. She's either hurt, as I can infer by the little uh, eight, uh, symbols by her knee, or her bicycle is damaged, and so her feelings are hurt rather than a physical hurt. Um, so we're going to um, fill in. We're going to look at this chart. And figure of language is a comparison using like or as. So it's comparing two unlike things using like or as. Um, a metaphor is a comparison of two unlike things and which one becomes the other. And personification gives human characteristics to non-human objects. So an example of that is she has a smile like sunshine. That's like me. Um, he is a bear of a man is the metaphor. And the boiling tea kettle screeched its complaint. Let's talk about those. She has a smile like sunshine. What two things are being compared there? Okay, smile. Smile and sunshine. And here is our word in a simile that lets us know it's a simile, the word like. Now look at the metaphor, look at the definition. A comparison of two unlike things in which one becomes the other thing. So what is being compared here? A bear and a man. Is there any like or as? No. The bear has become, or the man has become a bear. And then the personification is when human characteristics are given to non-human things. Um, so what is our non-human thing in, in this text? We have a boiling tea kettle. And what is this boiling tea kettle? What is the human characteristic that it's been given? It's screeching. Okay. So... Can a tea kettle literally screech? No. It does, however, produce a noise when the water is ready to be poured out. It gives that little whistling, high-pitched screech, but it is not literally screeching. So those are the three examples of simile, metaphor, and personification. And then uh, readers can identify the items that are being compared. We did that very well uh, and what they have in common. Uh, they can also consider the feelings that the words create to appreciate what the author is trying to say. So what is the author trying to say when she says she has a smile like sunshine? Very good. It means that she's probably happy. Uh, how about he is a bear of a man. That was easy. It means he's upset um, or grumpy. And then the boiling tea kettle screeched. We talked about that one when I was explaining it. It means that it's making it sound to let you know that it's ready to be poured out. Okay, now we're going to uh, flip on over to our next. task, 
uh, model instruction, and we're going to read the beginning of a short story below. Okay, so we're on page 130, and we're reading The Gold Watch by Matthew Allen. Sunlight burst through the window and woke Gabriel that bright summer day. He felt disoriented, as if he'd been sleeping for years. He didn't even know what time it was. But that was no surprise. He was always late. He pulled on his clothes and went out to the yard where he found his mother sorting through boxes of old things. Why did you get all that junk out of the garage? Gabriel asked his mom. It's not junk, his mother answered. These are things that I have saved over the years, but it's time to have a yard sale and let them go. Gabriel's mother pulled a broken coffee maker out of one box, the electrical cord trailing behind like a tail. Next, his mother held up a pocket watch as golden as a tiny sun. Okay, so keep that page open and we're going to flip over to the chart. And you guys are going to help us fill out this chart using that text. So explore the answer to this question. To what does the author compare the electrical cord and how does this make you imagine the coffee maker? So think about that in your mind when Gabriel sees his mom pulling out the coffee maker and what it looks like with the electrical cord And so we see he's comparing the cord to a what? Good, Javier. Good. He's comparing the cord to a tail. And that is giving the coffee maker a certain kind of quality within this text. So what is the device being used? What kind of quality can that cause you to think about that core? Okay, it's being compared to a tail, so that gives the coffee maker Right, Javier, again, Javier's on it today. The coffee maker has the qualities of an animal. So if you think about the kinds of figurative language that were introduced to you on page 129, the coffee maker's core is like a tail. So, what kind of figurative language is that? Over here? A simile? Very nice. What word or words helped you know that it is a simile rather than a metaphor or personification? Very good. It is uh, comparing using like, so I'll put that in parentheses to let us know that the word like, let us know that this is probably a simile. Okay. Uh, also, 
what other kind of argument might one be able to make? Because you know we've been working on your essay writing and making points and arguments. So, what kind of other figurative language with the core being like a tail? Okay, I'll give it, I'll, I'll put it forth another hint. Do coffee makers have tails? Correct. No, no, they don't have tails. Do non-living things have tails? Correct. No. So see, the tricky thing that we're encountering here is giving human qualities to something non-human. Well, instead of saying human qualities, we could substitute the word human for living qualities. So, if you want to grow up to be an attorney and, and have to work on making arguments, nobody could rule you totally out if you picked personification. They couldn't rule you totally out because a living quality is being attributed here. True, humans don't have tails, but we've got the aspect of living qualities. But let's take that a little bit further on your test taking skills since you have tests coming up soon and you're going to have multiple choice tests. So we've talked about two possible answers here. One, well, you can really make an argument for it and, and, uh, you would have a good point. However, what would be the best answer? Now, like she said, you can prove either one of these. If it is a multiple choice, you have to choose the best selection that is there. If it is a short constructive response, you could choose either one as long as you chose your right textual evidence, your relevant evidence, and you explain how that made it the other one. So if you chose personification and said that it gave living characteristics to a non-living thing, you could prove that with um, textual evidence. If you said it's definitely a simile because it uses like or as, you could prove that with textual evidence. So if you have a short constructive response, you can choose either one of those. If it is a multiple choice, then the testers, who are not necessarily the writers of curriculum, they're just the writers of tests, they're going to want the one that it is most like. Most like and most likely to be correct. Yes. So which one would you choose if it were multiple choice? Jorge, muy bien, muy bien, Jorge. We would go with the first one as the best answer. Any questions about that? Okay. Now are we ready to go on to the next comparison? Yes. Okay. Next comparison. You guys uh, find, um, help Miss Maddox locate another comparison in here that we can put up on the board of two things that are being compared. Either using like or as, where one becomes the other, or where living characteristics are given to non-living objects.
Okay, good, Maria. It, it takes a while to find that one because the comparison is at the very end. His mother held up a pocket watch as golden as a tiny sun. So, Maria, what would you like me to write down as to what is being compared? Very good. A pocket watch and a tiny sun. Okay. Good. So the next box that we're going to fill out is how are they alike? How are the pocket watch and the tiny sun alike in the text? Look for an adjective. Look for a describing word. A word that describes. Jorge, very good. I'm glad that you were able to use some of the, the new um, English that you've been learning um, in your colors and things like that. And I'm glad that you were able to pick out golden. Yes, very good. So the meaning, the watch is... What? Good. The watch is golden. Golden. Okay. Now we blow this up so you guys can see it and make sure that your charts match this chart. Because the first one we helped you through and this one you guys basically picked out on your own. Mm -hmm. So we want your charts to show the work that you did. So fill out that ch your chart to say that the watch and the tiny sun are being compared, that they are alike because they are both the same color, or we don't, we don't have to say, wait, I, I can change this to, check this to similar in color, and then we don't. Mm -hmm. And you could even say they're both shiny, actually. <laughs> More shiny. Yeah. So, same color. Same, same glow, because the sun mm -hmm. is glowing golden. And then you can say that the meaning is the watch is golden. Um, and then, um, how does this comparison suggest Gabriel's feelings about the watch? And then we're going to um, take a few minutes, and you're going to write your answers on the lines that are on that page. And Ms. Maddox and I are going to come around and help you uh, with this task, we're going to help you write down what you think uh, this comparison suggests about Gabriel's feelings towards the watch. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> 